Hey everyone, I'm still waiting for the Tesla version 9 software update to get pushed out to my Model 3. However, my Model S received it this morning. So let's take a look at what Tesla software version 9 looks like in a Hardware One Model S. So this is it, software version 9. One of the biggest changes that Tesla made is that apps no longer run in two windows stacked on top of each other that can be swapped or full screened. Nav is kind of the whole thing now and apps run on top of Nav anchored to the bottom of the screen. It's very similar to the Model 3. Unfortunately, it means that you can't really run two apps at the same time other than nav plus something else. For example, if I open the media app with the media button right down there, you can see it comes to about a little less than the halfway point on the screen. This is its default size. You can then drag it up to make it larger. And this is as big as this one will go. Uh, flick it down to get back to the medium size and flick it down one more time to get the little mini player. Obviously, you can flick it down again to go away or you can just use the media button to show and hide it. That's all well and good, but there's a detail here that's been bugging me in the Model 3 and that is going to bug me in this car. And that's if you press the media button. All right, normal size. But what if you want the mini player? Well, you've got to press the media button, then flick that down. Now you have the mini player. That's two interactions, one a press and then one a precision flick to get the view that you want. It would make a lot more sense to press the media button once to bring it up to standard view and then press it a second time to get the mini player and then a third time to go away while still preserving the swipe interactions as well. That way if all you want is a mini player you have an easily indexed fixed point right here you go tap and then tap again to get what you want. That kind of an interaction makes a lot more sense when you're thinking of a touch UI in the context of a moving vehicle. You don't want something that takes too much attention and utilizing multiple taps of fixed points is a good way to do that. So if anyone on Tesla's software team is watching, perhaps add tap to change the size of the media app rather than relying solely on the swiping gesture. Moving right along, what started as a persistent row of app icons that were always present at the top of the screen and eventually changed to a collapsing app icon tray. Well, these have now all disappeared from the top part of the screen and are down here. Surprisingly, I actually find this to be kind of an improvement because it's a lot more responsive than the drop down app bar. So it just takes less time to pull things up, which is really nice. Another nice thing is that Tesla chose to keep the icons for the apps out of boxes or bubbles or anything so you can actually identify them by shape, which is important when you're dealing with a UI that people need to very quickly uh, recognize things with. So putting each of these in a little pill or a capsule or something would make them more difficult for drivers to recognize. That said, I'm not totally on board with removing all of the color from the icons because shape and color are two ways to quickly identify things in an interface that you're really not supposed to be staring at. Aside from the rear range, the apps are pretty much the same as they always were. Calendar is, well, calendar. Uh, energy is the same energy app that we've had for a while. The web browser is, well, the web browser, and we can make it big. Come on, make it bigger. There we go. We can make it bigger here, and uh, it runs a little better than it did before. And remember, this is, I'm not on the newer Intel MCU here. This is the, <laughs> the older Tegra 3 uh, MCU, but... In the past, it was barely able to run Tesla's website at all, which was really sad. So it's improved a bit, but it's still too slow to really be useful. Just use your phone. Put that away. Go away. The camera app is still the same old camera, but like I mentioned before, it is now anchored to the bottom of the screen. I can't swipe up to you know make it bigger or drag it to the top of the screen. It's just there now. So if you were one of the people who liked it up top, eh, too bad. It's down here now. Call is pretty much the same phone application that it was before. Nothing's really changed here. And uh, charging is accessible through that quick bar as well. It's starting to look a lot more kind of Model 3-ish in the styling with what they're doing down here. Uh, but again, it's pinned to the bottom of the screen. Not a big deal. It's also accessible from the lightning bolt up top, as always. An interesting and somewhat annoying UI quirk that I noticed is if you have an app open, let's say we're going to go ahead and open the uh, energy app here, right? It slides up, takes up its usual approximately half the screen. All right, well, let's say we want to change something in the media app real quick. Press media, energy app slides down, media app slides up. Okay, but now I'm done interacting with media. So I press the media button for it to go away and the energy app doesn't come back. So if you want to go back from media to energy, right? So we're in media now. You need to go up quick bar, then go to energy. So it's adding taps to accomplish what maybe should just be a quick card swap. 
unless the UI assumption here is that the user is done with the Energy app and isn't going to want it back immediately. But working with that as the assumption, let's go ahead and open the Media app, all right, and then we'll switch to Energy. Okay, got the Energy app up. Now let's close the Energy app. Oh, look, Media comes back, but it doesn't work that way with the Energy app. These are just weird little things, and I'm sure Tesla looked at their usage data to figure out which app should have priority over others, uh, but it is still fun noticing these behaviors. The heated seat controls no longer have numbers in them when you turn them on. They just produce more or less bacon as you press them. Three bacon, two bacon, one bacon, no bacon. Quite a few changes have been made to the HVAC controls. You'll see that there's only one number here instead of two. Previously, there was a right adjustment and left adjustment, and that only appears now when you enter the controls here, you change temperature, press sync. All right, now you've got your left and right because you've uh, taken these out of sync with each other. However, pressing sync rejoins them again into one control. This little HVAC control section that popped up here is very reminiscent from a style standpoint of the Model 3, uh, but it is way, way easier to use than what the Model S had previously. So your controls, they visually make sense. They're large touch points, easy to interact with. Um, Downside is that now it's two taps to uh, shut off the climate control. Previously, you could just press it and it would shut off. Now, if you want to shut it off, you have to press it and then press the power button. But again, that's very similar to the Model 3. Other major interface changes were made here in vehicle controls, which that took way too long to pop up, although it only seems to be the first time. Now it pops up pretty quickly. Anyway, the default quick controls thing has been completely redone. Previously, you had persistent controls across the bottom for things like lights and, and doors and all that stuff. Um, and then your vehicle controls began up here. Well, they've done away with that in creating this quick controls page. Unfortunately, there isn't that much that's useful on here. I mean, I'm sure some people have just displayed brightness, but for the most part, I've always just left that on auto. So I don't know why that's there. That never gets touched. Exterior lights. I'm sure that there's probably only been maybe like 5% of Tesla owners who have ever touched this aside from setting it to auto. Uh, but you do have your basic unlock, frunk opening, trunk opening, that stuff here. But I feel like this is just not control dense enough here for quick controls. For example, if I want to turn on the dome lights, well, I've got to go to lights and turn them on in dome lights. Whereas previously, I could turn them on via the persistent piece at the bottom here in the quick controls menu. Style-wise, this is starting to look a little more Model 3-ish. Um, and they've also broken things up in such a way as to eliminate the separate settings tab because you had you know, controls and settings tabs up. I think it was controls over here and settings over there. It's all now just one thing with uh, a bar on the left to navigate through the different, uh, the different uh, menus. We're also starting to see a mix here of these large, easy to interact with bars and then these small Model 3 style little like button switches. For the most part, the reorganization in here makes sense. Things are logically laid out. You know, you go to driving, you're going to find your normal driving controls. Um, that said, I, I don't really agree with range mode being turned into a little tiny button switch because these little button switch styles here imply that they're not really something you should be interacting with while driving because it's a much smaller touch point. Whereas these larger touch points, again, kind of imply that these are things you're supposed to be interacting with while driving. I feel like, if anything, like regenerative braking who messes with that while they're driving? Put that down here as one of these little switches. Put range mode up here as a nice, big, easy to touch toggle. The range mode control is something that people may actually interact with while driving. In fact, maybe put that under quick controls so that they aren't having to dig through menus. Moving on to the autopilot settings, they've simplified this page quite a bit, which is probably for the best because its original layout may have been intimidating for some users. Uh, the settings are all, are all here though. Um, going through vehicle, you've got you know your basic settings here. As I go through this, though, one thing you're probably noting is that they've organized it in such a way as to try to prevent scrolling. There's like there's really almost nothing that scrolls. That doesn't scroll. They fit it all on one page. I think the only menu that scrolls, yes, is here in safety and security. And even then, it's it's just to show the the data sharing button. Everything else is still visible otherwise. Uh, so that's probably a good choice. Uh, from a UI standpoint, when we're talking about, again, something people have to interact with while driving, you don't want to have to scroll through menus. Um, and also, apparently, a swipe down dismisses it. The lighting's changing on me here, so let me show you what you're probably really here for, which is Atari games. You get to the Atari games by pressing the Tesla T at the top and then getting your Easter egg tray out, pressing Atari. And there we go. Let's see. Uh, what do we want to play? Let's play... Uh, you've got Asteroids. Lunar Lander, Missile Command, and Centipede. Uh, let's do Asteroids. There we go, loading up. 
Actually, no, let's not do asteroids. <laughs> let's do lunar lander. I haven't tried that one yet. Oh, okay. We can hear the lunar lander rumbling now. So let's go full screen. Three taps to exit. Got it. All right, now can I control this with the... Okay, I control angle with the scroll wheels. All right, now how do I fire the... Oh, that, okay, that's how you fire thrusters. All right, I'll tip this way. The audio plays through the... Uh, the car's speakers. There we go. Come on, little lander. Ah! Too much delta V! Too much delta V! Ooh. Neil Armstrong, I am not. Anyway, that was a quick look at version 9 on a Hardware One Model S. I, I may do a deeper dive on it later, but there were a lot of features in version 9 that just didn't make it to the Hardware One cars, understandably, like the improved blind spot detection um, and the, the dash cam functionality and, and that sort of stuff. It's just, if you're on a Hardware One car, you don't get those toys. So I really look forward to playing with version 9 in my Model 3, since it's going to get a whole lot more features than this car will. Anyway, that's about it for this video. If you have any questions or comments, go ahead and leave those in the comments down below. Don't forget to rate and subscribe, and I'll see you later.